In the southern part of Croatia, along the Adriatic Sea, lies the city of Dubrovnik. If you are a big fan of Game of Thrones, you would easily recognize this as the real-life King's Landing, as it was the main filming location for this fictional city. However, for game creators, this city is also well known as the home of an annual conference for the game industry, the Reboot Develop. This conference is focused primarily on game developers, artists, audio artists, game publishers, and other esteemed members of the gaming community. On April 11th, 2019, Reboot Develop held its seventh edition, gathering up to 2,000 attendees from around the world, featuring a diverse and illustrious lineup of speakers. But what made this event truly special was the presence of Fumito Ueda and Hidetaka Miyazaki, who both shared the stage and presented a joint opening keynote address. This is a very rare event indeed, as both of them are legendary figures in their own right. In this video, we will go through the key topics they discussed in their presentation and shed light on their perspectives and approach to game creation. Join me as we explore the minds of these two titans of game design and uncover new insights into their craft. While preparing this video, I initially thought that its core value lay in the Reboot Conference, as it was the impetus for its creation. However, as my research progressed, I came to realize the equal importance of understanding the background and attributes of Ueda and the similarities and differences he shares with Miyazaki. To fully appreciate the importance of the Reboot event, let's journey back in time to the year 1999. If you recall from our video on the rise of Hidetaka Miyazaki, after graduating from Keio University, he aspired to work in the game industry, but faced financial constraints. He shared, I originally wanted to work in the game industry. However, after finishing graduate school, there was a situation where I needed a lot of money. Subsequent interviews revealed the specific reason for needing that money. He had to support his younger sister's college education. However, after spending a few years working at Oracle and fulfilling his duties, thanks to a friend's recommendation, Miyazaki discovered a game that sparked an epiphany, motivating him to continue pursuing his dream of working in the game industry. The title of this game that had a profound impact on him is Eco. Miyazaki shared in interviews that the Dark Souls series would never have existed without Eco. In fact, he wouldn't have left Oracle and joined from software if it hadn't been for this game. He said, On a personal note, after graduating from university and starting a new job, I was away from games for a while. However, I happened to play Eco at a friend's house on a recommendation. It was a beautiful, untold experience, and a story that I had never imagined. I'm very sorry to my friend, but I was quietly moved and silent. That's when I decided to leave the company I was working for at the time and started working for From Software. I'm not exaggerating when I say it was the game that changed my life, and I'm proud that it was Eco and it was Mr. Weda's game. The game awakened me to the possibilities of the medium. I wanted to make one myself. Now that we have established the significance of Eco in Hidetaka Miyazaki's life, let's delve into the background of its creator. Fumito Ueda was born on April 19, 1970, in Japan's Hyogo Prefecture, and grew up in the city of Tatsuno in a rural area. During his childhood, he had a deep affection for various animals and was known for his adventurous nature, often hiding in the mountains. Despite not being particularly studious as a student, he had a strong passion for drawing manga, a love that blossomed from an early age. During his formative years, Ueda discovered the world of video games through Nintendo's Famicom and Sega's Master System. Among his favorite pastimes was spending hours playing Konami's Smash Ping Pong. It was during this period that he decided to pursue a career in the realm of artistic endeavors. While residing in Osaka and attending Osaka University of Arts, he opted to delve into the study of abstract art. In an interview, he mentioned that he chose abstract art due to its demand for less technical effort and time, compared to realistic, representational art. Although initially not a dedicated student, he gradually became more diligent and committed toward the conclusion of his studies. Concurrently, his passion for video games continued to flourish during his university years. Notably, he played a lot of Genesis and developed a fondness for Eric Chahi's Another World and Jordan Mechner's Game Boy adaptation of Prince of Persia. The expressive aesthetic and minimalist storytelling of the former along with the engaging gameplay of the latter, 
significantly influenced his evolving preferences, later shaping his own creative ventures. To support his studies financially, he worked at a video rental store. This job exposed him to a plethora of films that served as another wellspring of inspiration, further fueling his imaginative endeavors. Ueda pondered his future, aspiring to sustain himself through his art. Despite his interest, he didn't particularly enjoy visiting museums. Instead, he immersed himself in video games and movies. Aware of the challenges of earning a livelihood as an artist in the modern world, he decided to invest in an Amiga computer, using money from selling his motorbike. He embarked on a self-taught journey, relying on extensive reading and the Amiga instruction manual, which was written in English, necessitating the use of a dictionary. Through this process, he honed his skills in creating computer graphics, with a particular focus on mastering the program LightWave 3D. Regarded as one of the most renowned 3D computer graphics software, LightWave has been a staple in movies, television, video games, and animation since the 1990s. Its application can be observed in notable films such as Jurassic Park, Titanic, The Lord of the Rings, and Avatar. Equipped with this expertise, he commenced part-time employment at a computer graphics design company while concurrently engaging with the local TV station, Kanzai Television. However, his trajectory began to solidify in 1995 when he secured a position at the video game developer Warp, renowned for its game D, a horror-adventure game structured as an interactive movie. He secured this role by submitting film projects he had worked on as part of his application. He contributed to various games within the graphics and animation department, initially as an animator for a new version of D, titled D's Diner, Director's Cut. He then transitioned to working on the survival horror game Enemy Zero. His involvement extended beyond crafting visual elements, as he also participated in directing some of its cutscenes. The workload was demanding due to understaffing, requiring the team to endure many long hours. Ueda expressed that while he found enjoyment during this period, he also encountered significant frustration due to the lack of complete artistic control. Dissatisfied with his employers, he departed to pursue his own project. This personal endeavor eventually materialized into the game famously known as Eco. Ueda revealed, At the time I quit from the company I was working at, I already had the idea for Eco. The name too, and I had an image of a tall girl pulled along by a boy just holding her hand, but I wasn't sure whether it would be a movie or a game. Although he devoted time to developing Eco, dwindling savings prompted him to seek employment once more. Fortunately, Sony Computer Entertainment was seeking a CG artist. Ueda elaborated, I applied for that, but I had one condition, that I couldn't work full time because I needed time for myself. Sony asked what I was doing in my own time, so I started to talk about Eco. They understood the idea, and then suggested I work on that in Sony. While at Sony, Ueda initiated the most productive and artistic period of his career, creating three of his masterpieces, Eco, Shadow of the Colossus, and The Last Guardian. Through these three games, Ueda demonstrated the possibility of designing a video game where every facet, every element, carried the artistic vision and philosophy of its creator. Undoubtedly, the essential contributions of his development team were crucial in bringing these games to life down to their smallest details. Additionally, the vital role played by game producer Kenji Kaido for Eco and Shadow of the Colossus ensured that the team had all the necessary resources and support from Sony to realize these two projects. Nevertheless, Ueda remains the mastermind behind his creations, directing visual choices, gameplay designs, storylines, and character animations. As a perfectionist with high standards, he underwent three rather long development periods, each with the same objective, to uphold his initial vision until the very end. Today, Fumito Ueda is hailed as a visionary in the realm of video game design, celebrated for his unparalleled ability to craft emotionally evocative experiences through minimalist storytelling, breathtaking aesthetics, and innovative gameplay mechanics. His masterpieces such as Eco, Shadow of the Colossus, and The Last Guardian 
stand as timeless works of art that transcend mere gaming, inspiring generations of game developers and earning him widespread acclaim as an iconic figure in the realm of interactive storytelling. Before delving into the similarities and differences between Miyazaki and Ueda, let's first explore the media that has influenced Ueda's works. In our previous video discussing the rise of Miyazaki, we highlighted how he was significantly shaped by role-playing adventure books and the manga he immersed himself in during his youth. These influences greatly contributed to the essence of his dark fantasy games, with a strong emphasis on character stats, upgrades, skills, and items. Similarly, Ueda's creative vision was shaped by the media he consumed in his younger years. Reflecting on these influences, Ueda remarked, There are some games that have opened my eyes and influenced me in big ways. Prince of Persia is one, and another world. This may come as a surprise, but Virtua Fighter is another. What they all have in common is the intricacy of the animation. I'm always curious in finding ways that animation can help breathe new life into characters. That's an element that will always appeal to me. Jordan Mechner's cult classic, initially released on the Apple II in 1989, fundamentally reshaped the platform game genre. It broke away from traditional arcade features, such as the concept of a score. Instead, it emphasized movements, embracing credible physics. Unlike Mario, the prince doesn't execute leaps covering many feet at once. His jumps are grounded in realistic inertia. The game emanates an exotic ambience infused with a sense of isolation sparse enemies to confront, oppressive landscapes illuminated by torches, and a soundscape rich in sound effects rather than music contribute to this atmosphere. These aspects resonate with elements commonly found in Ueda's games. Similarly, the setting within a castle demonstrates an economy of resources that enhances the experience's distinctiveness. Further parallels with Ueda's games lie in the animations and the utilization of realistic physics. Prince of Persia showcased impressive rendering for its time. As mentioned earlier, it marked a departure from the norms of platform games. Alongside the original sword fights, the prince's diverse actions – running, crouching, jumping, and even wall climbing by hanging – were groundbreaking for the era. While these actions are now fundamental in adventure games, they were highly innovative at that time. The impact of Prince of Persia on the realm of video games remains undeniable, reverberating from titles like Tomb Raider and God of War to Assassin's Creed. Eric Chahi's award-winning creation, initially launched for the Amiga and Atari platforms in 1991, has always stood out as a unique piece in the video game landscape. Its distinctiveness is a result of its environment, visual and auditory representation, structure, and its skillful use of suggestion and the unspoken. Right from the outset, the game exhibits cinematic aspirations apparent in its staging and editing, establishing a distinctive identity through vector image graphics. This artistic choice results in a refined aesthetic, further reinforced by the deliberate absence of typical visual components found in video games – no health bar, inventory, menu, or map. Ueda similarly adopted this approach in Eco. The game's premise is straightforward. The protagonist must navigate a strange world inhabited by a hostile humanoid alien race. The story's context and unfolding events are never explicitly explained, but rather conveyed visually inviting players to interpret a substantial portion of the narrative. The aliens communicate using an unknown language, devoid of any subtitles. Ueda also employed this technique, emphasizing non-verbal communication when characters cannot understand each other through speech, relying on their actions instead. Although the environments of Another World and Eco differ significantly, the two games share a similar philosophy, a minimalist approach, environmental storytelling, the art of the unspoken, silent interactions, and a soundtrack that relies heavily on ambient sound effects while sparingly using music. All these elements collectively aim to break away from traditional video game techniques. The film The King and the Mockingbird is regarded as a masterpiece of French animation and has been cited by Japanese directors Hayao Miyazaki and Isao Takahata as an influence. Although Ueda has never mentioned in any interview that this animation influenced his games, many members of the community believe that it did. The film tells the story of a tyrannical king who falls in love with a shepherdess. When the king's attempts to win her affection are interrupted by a mischievous mockingbird, the two, along with a chimney sweep, 
embark on a whimsical adventure through a fantastical world to challenge the king's oppressive rule and find true freedom and love. Every aspect of this escape by the shepherdess and the chimney sweep strongly echoes Eco. The two lovers hold hands as they run. The shepherdess has bare feet and emits a fragility similar to Yorda's. The castle in which they are prisoners is an immense structure of gigantic proportions, with maze-like architecture that could swallow up the two characters. Giorgio de Chirico was an influential artist known for creating captivating paintings that depicted mysterious and dreamlike cityscapes. His artworks often featured empty town squares, classical buildings and long shadows, evoking a sense of intrigue and curiosity. If you observe carefully, you will notice a striking resemblance between de Chirico's paintings and both the Japanese and European covers of the game Eco. The influence is undeniable. The colors used, the tiny silhouettes of Eco and Yorda holding hands, the shadows stretching over the entire painting, the vague geometrical perspectives, and the monumental architecture of the windmill and the arches. Everything evokes the works of Giorgio de Chirico. In particular, the artwork bears a strong resemblance to melancholy and mystery of a street, as seen here. Additionally, it echoes the nostalgia of the infinite, where tiny silhouettes of two people face a giant tower. These similarities are not coincidental. Ueda himself confirmed the influence, stating, I designed the Japanese cover, and I thought the surrealistic world of de Chirico matched the allegoric world of Eco. From Prince of Persia to the artistry of Giorgio de Chirico, Ueda drew inspiration from his understanding of art and impactful video game encounters that left a mark on him. Similar to these influential sources that shaped his work, Ueda, in turn, left his imprint on the creations of Hidetaka Miyazaki. In this section, we will cover the attributes of Ueda and his games that highlight the uniqueness of his approach to game design. The first thing that you will notice when playing games by Ueda is how non-gamey they are, lacking features that you would normally find in traditional video games. This approach is evident through the deliberate use of minimal user interface and menus, the absence of game stats and parameters, minimal NPCs and dialogues, and a focus on highly immersive gameplay. As early as his first game, Ueda's preference for minimal clutter in the user interface has been evident, with the removal of any visual indicators on the screen. Regarding this approach, Ueda shared, Yeah, there were a lot of comments. Eco is a game with no tutorial, no gauges. In many senses, it's a game defined by what is not there. So people would say things like, Why don't you add an icon above the girl's head so the player can know how she's feeling? Or they'd question the merit of the hand-holding system. By being true to his objective and upholding his creative vision until the very end, Weta removed superfluous gamification mechanics and elements, and focused on the core essence of his games. This contributes to highly immersive gameplay, which we will cover in the next sections. Aligned with the absence of UI clutter, Ueda's games notably lack features related to managing character stats and parameters. Ueda himself has shared his perspective on this, explaining why his games lack such features. He said, I don't really like to read manuals or to manage parameters. If you start to make games, in the beginning, you naturally make games that you would want to play. Additionally, there is the fact that we want to appeal to non-gamers. The simpler, the better. Later, when we delve into the section comparing Miyazaki and Ueda, we will revisit this topic. Furthermore, during the reboot event, this will also be discussed again, as it stands as one of the key differentiators in their approaches to game design. You will also observe that Ueda's games have very few NPCs. He could have easily placed some stray characters in his games Eco and Shadow of the Colossus. If these games were handled by a different game director, you could easily imagine a merchant selling fragments of the maps, or a blacksmith offering his services to upgrade weapons. Regarding the lack of NPCs in his games, Ueda shared, There are two things that I really hate. One is invisible collisions, for example. There's nothing there, but you can't go forward. There are some games that have this. Another is the character who repeats the same phrases. For example, when you go to hear his story, he gives you a hint. But each time he gives you the same hint, it makes the character feel lifeless. I didn't want to make that mistake, and I wondered if I could find a new solution. Ueda shared that he removed superfluous gamification mechanics and elements found in traditional games to maximize the immersiveness of his games. As an example, 
Here is Ueda's perspective relating to gravity, which in the future would impact the Souls games. He shared, We hated these objects that were very unnaturally placed in levels just for the sake of level design, so we removed them as well. For example, in Eco, we don't have invisible walls that would normally prevent the player character from falling off, and when we really needed those walls, we made them look very convincing. Another scenario where Weda's adherence to player immersion was displayed was when they were changing the platform for Eco from PlayStation 1 to PlayStation 2. This change brought up an unexpected problem, the graphics representation. In Weda's view, the game's enemies, which were originally human guards, now appeared too realistic. So, he changed the appearance of them to shadows. He said, due to the behavior of the enemy, we thought that if it were human-like, or even resembled other living creatures, it would visually be too much. This also applies to the reason for there being shadows or smoke. They can arise from anywhere and disappear easily. This gives the enemy characters a more realistic touch when you think of their behavior. Another reason was to simply make it easier for players to differentiate on screen, which is the boy, Yorda, and the enemy. For Ueda, immersion didn't mean aiming for photorealism, but rather emotional realism. He wanted the players to believe the story told to them and to believe in the world they were exploring. To achieve this, the character had to be able to freely move within a believable environment with which he could interact. Regarding the value of immersion in his games, Ueda shared, as a creator, I think that developing a truly immersive experience and creating a believable reality even within a fictional world is very important and unique to the interactive nature of gaming. Later, when we approach the section comparing Ueda and Miyazaki, we'll observe how Ueda represents an extreme version of Miyazaki. Take Total Direction, for example, a topic we covered in our previous video. It serves as the pillar and foundation of Miyazaki's approach to game design and development. In that video, many viewers perceived Miyazaki's methods as bordering on micromanagement. If his approach to game direction seemed controlling, it would be even more pronounced with Weta, given his ability to draw, animate, and create character designs and animations, something Miyazaki couldn't do. Visual arts and computer artwork were Weta's specialties and domains before he became a game director. Consequently, there's no intermediary layer between him and the actual work. He can and will adjust aspects of the game that don't satisfy him. Understanding and appreciating Weta's uniqueness involves recognizing him as an authentic artist who uses video games as a medium to express his art. When comprehended from this perspective, all the elements that make him different and unusual compared to other game creators become clear. He identifies primarily as an artist before a gamer, forming a stark contrast with Miyazaki, who is a gamer through and through. Miyazaki focuses on gameplay and game mechanics, whereas Ueda prioritizes the experience and expression of his art, which happens to manifest in the format of a video game. We can catch glimpses of this when Ueda described his life as an art student, stating, Yeah, they did. People from that art school milieu, they're all highly individualistic. They think very differently from the rest of society. Even I didn't really realize how different they are. Most of their favorite artists are totally unknown, and their own artistic expression is, how to put it, very unique. Now, consider this subsequent statement he shared as he was about to enter the game industry. In the very beginning, of course, my ideas were related to the art and visuals, but overall I would have to say it was the desire to distinguish myself and do something different. I wanted to create something no one had ever created. Whatever genre or type of game I made, I knew I wanted to do something unique. The alignment between these two statements, sourced from different interviews, showcases his individualism and his aspiration to set himself apart, consistent with how he described the individuals he encountered at his art school. The distinctiveness of Ueda becomes more apparent in another statement he shared during a separate interview. Considering his background as an art student and an artist, this statement aligns perfectly. He shared, yeah, this is also something I've said a lot, but when I originally entered the game industry, I wasn't someone who knew anything about the fundamentals of games, so-called game design, or how to go about directing a game. Later when I moved to Sony, I was given a chance to make a game myself. I wondered to myself if I could make something different that could contend with a profitable, commercial release created by experienced game creators. As a result, I was going to make my game by removing all the game-like elements from it that I could. 
I think partly it was my youth, but I wanted to do the opposite of what others were doing. Those were some of my very first ideas when it came to creating Eco. Kenji Kaido, the game producer who supported Ueda during the creation of Eco and Shadow of the Colossus, shares insight about him. When Ueda creates a game, it's very obvious that his logic is different from your typical developer. He doesn't begin with a story or world, he just suddenly starts crafting his vision, gradually shaping it into its final form. He doesn't feel bound by the kinds of games that exist today. My role is to ask questions like, maybe the game should be a little more game-like here, but he never listens anyway. One last example showcasing Ueda's artistic approach rather than a gamer's perspective is this question related to the PlayStation 3. In the interview, the host asked, how do you feel about the PS3's graphical capabilities? Are you worried that it'll cause too much focus on realistic graphics? Ueda replied, that's a difficult question. Looking at the games presented at the 2005 Tokyo Game Show, a lot of them have very high quality, hyper-realistic graphics, and we could do the same thing, but we'd leave ourselves with no differentiation between our work and that of the other developers. Also, the games that have the highest quality graphics tend to sacrifice character or object movement for that. Finally, here is a statement that we would never imagine Miyazaki or Shigeru Miyamoto saying, but it is obviously something that can easily come from Ueda. Ueda said, I would be very happy if video games became a cultural equivalent to movies and music. There are many people who play video games at a young age but stop playing when they get older. I hear about people graduating from video games but I hardly hear about those graduating from films or music. I believe this is because video games are acknowledged as immature. If this preconception can be changed, it would be most wonderful. Miyazaki's desire is to create highly engaging games that he and other gamers would love and enjoy playing. In contrast, Ueda is on a mission to elevate the video game medium as an art form. Ueda is an artist first and gamer second. Now that we understand Ueda's aspiration to express his artistry through video games and his objective to heighten the immersion within his games, it logically follows that he would remove any superfluous element hindering this goal. He would retain only those aspects that enhance the essence of his creations. This naturally leads us to the final topic of this section. If there is one thing that most people are acquainted with or have heard about regarding Ueda's approach to game design, it is the concept of design by subtraction. The idea behind design by subtraction is to extract the very essence of what you're designing and remove the unnecessary fluff around it. As Ueda explained, when I'm deciding whether or not to put something in the game, I'm always looking for meaning behind it, no matter what. Like, does it make sense to put smaller enemies in the game just so you can get items and experience points? I wouldn't have been able to forgive myself if I'd had a colossus you wouldn't be able to beat without some item you'd get defeating smaller enemies. I had the idea of being able to warp through the use of an item, for example, but the huge field would have become pointless. There are two ideas central to the game. Colossi you have to climb and defeat, and an enormous field. I think that once we kept the overall consistency in mind, it was inevitable that the game would turn out like this. Design by subtraction involves removing all the parts that weigh things down and take away from that core experience. This is most evident in Eco and The Last Guardian, where the core aspect of the game is the relationship between the protagonists. In Eco, you play as a warrior boy tasked with escorting Yorda through the maze of levels. The standard gaming mechanic of health is stripped away. There's no UI to speak of, no dialogue, and nothing else that you would expect from a game. There's only Yorda and Eco. Devoid of standard gamification, what endures is their connection, a strong and resonant bond. This approach also helped significantly in reducing budgetary costs, while allowing the team to focus on details and achieve the desired immersive realism. Going against all the standards of the time, Ueda removed all visual elements that could remind the player that it was a video game, including the health bar, which had existed in earlier versions of Eco. In the same vein, he left out inventory and non-playable characters one could talk to in role-playing games. Music was minimized to essential moments, allowing exploration to primarily unfold through nearby sounds and moments of silence. This philosophy was inherited directly from his personal tastes, as Ueda cared little about complex statistics and inventories in games. In the logic of design by subtraction, every element that was not perfect was removed from the game. Little by little, 
anything superfluous was removed, and only the purest essence of the experience was kept. Ueda shared, Whether it was the girl's animation or the details of the map, I didn't hold back on removing and subtracting elements as needed. If something felt unfinished or lacking, then I'd remove it. Total direction is the foundation of Miyazaki's approach to game development, and we have covered it extensively in our previous video. Earlier, we highlighted that Ueda not only shares similarities with Miyazaki regarding total direction, but represents an extreme version of it. Two examples underscore this viewpoint. The first example comes from Kenji Kaido, the producer of Ico and Shadow of the Colossus. From his statement, it becomes evident that Ueda is highly selective about team members and takes on multiple roles himself. This practice is the primary reason why the teams working on his games are notably smaller compared to typical game development teams. Kenji Kaido revealed, When we started creating Shadow of the Colossus, we published a job advertisement to recruit more staff. There were about 500 applications, if I remember correctly. We employed 10 of them, but only one or two were of the standard Ueda was looking for. He ended up repeating what he did during Ico, taking up various roles himself. I guess if we had another Ueda, we would have released the game in two years instead of four. The second example is a direct statement from Ueda, saying, I did do some rough sketches for Ico, but since I originally worked in 3D graphics, I mostly just created everything directly in 3D. Also, because I can draw, I often end up making some selfish requests of everyone. I know what I want, and I have a logic behind it, but I don't know how to explain it very well. So what ends up happening is if I think something isn't good, I'll just touch it up and fix it myself. Whether it's animation or the stage design or whatever, I'm like, let me see that for a minute, and then I spend all night fixing it up how I want. I'm sure it probably caused the staff a lot of problems. It's conceivable that if Ueda isn't content with the work, he will personally modify it, an action unimaginable for Miyazaki. Both Miyazaki and Ueda emerged as outsiders in the game industry. When Miyazaki joined From Software at the age of 30, he lacked any prior experience in game design and development. Similarly, Ueda, an art student skilled in computer graphics and animation, entered the industry devoid of specific game design experience. Their trajectories toward becoming game directors were accelerated, learning the craft while on the job. Once more, Ueda exemplifies the extreme version of Miyazaki's journey. When assembling his team for game development, Ueda actively sought individuals akin to outsiders like himself. He believed that recruiting individuals entrenched solely in the video game industry might hinder his creative vision. Ueda shared, Well, we didn't want to make a gamey game from the start, so we felt that bringing in people who were entrenched in video games and the industry might be a problem. So we brought people in who didn't have a lot of experience, or from other areas like video production. In all our videos detailing the creation of the Souls games, the fundamental principle of gameplay first remains a cornerstone, guiding Miyazaki's approach to game design. For him, crafting the story consistently follows the development of gameplay mechanics. Notably, Ueda also adheres to this game design principle, expressing, I believe that there should be game design first, and a story that suits the design, not the other way around. If video game production were to be compared to writing, I believe it's closer to looking for words to fit in the squares of a crossword puzzle, rather than composing sentences with whatever words you like on a fresh sheet of manuscript paper. Consequently, it still lacks the degree of creative freedom found in the creation of novels and films. Kenji Kaido echoes this sentiment, stating, Many studios start by creating a story and construct the gameplay around that concept. This is not the way we work. In our team we start by defining a series of precise actions. Then we take those actions and build movements to visualize our ideas. We start to build gameplay mechanics based on that. The scenario and setting are added at a later stage. If there's one attribute highly shared between Miyazaki's and Ueda's games, it's their inclination to allow players to approach the game's story as they see fit and craft their own personal interpretations. This approach has led to an abundance of Souls lore speculation on platforms like YouTube, an experience integral to every new member of the Souls community. Similarly, Ueda's games sparked numerous fan theories, emphasizing the player's role in shaping the game's narrative. Regarding this inclination to allow players to shape the game's narrative, Ueda expressed, Video games are different from other media. They are interactive. In order to move the players, we have to create a believable world and then let them imagine everything else. 
I don't want players to try and think what my ideas for the story were. I want them to direct the story themselves. One can say that my intention is to give players the building steps, a small introduction, and then let them experience and develop their own personal stories. In our video about Miyazaki, we highlighted his childhood fondness for adventure books that contained content beyond his comprehension. This compelled him to imagine and invent the portions he couldn't yet understand. As a game director, he strived to impart a comparable experience for players, evident in the Souls game's use of environmental storytelling, where lore and information are embedded in the environment and item descriptions. Similarly, Ueda draws inspiration from experiences like playing games and watching movies in foreign languages he doesn't understand. He mentally constructs plots based on the visuals and expressions, embracing the power of imagination. He shared, It's a little difficult for me to explain, but games like Flashback, Another World, and even Grand Theft Auto 3, I'm not very good at English, so I don't really understand what's going on in those worlds very well. That's been the case with most games I've personally imported. And yet, it's precisely my not knowing that makes the experience exciting. There's a movie called The Iron Giant, and for that too, I found the English version more moving than the Japanese. I didn't understand what they were saying, but what I imagined in my own head was all the more moving to me. Ueda's application of this approach is evident in Ico, where the main characters communicate solely through gestures, motions, and reactions, showcasing the impact of non-verbal storytelling. Discussing his narrative style, Ueda shared, For me, it's not important to tell the details of the story. In Japan, there is a poet expression called a haiku, where you don't explain some things in detail and let the receivers understand or use their imagination with what is presented. That lets the receivers make their own story from their imagination. And I think this is also a good style of expression for video games, at this moment. In the future, someone may discover there's another way to do narrative and tell stories through gaming. But at this moment, I think this is a great way to tell stories. In some movies, the story is so complete, there isn't any ending you can guess because it's already done. That type of movie doesn't leave a long-lasting impression. From our previous videos, we've learned about Miyazaki's meticulous approach to boss designs. He instructs his art designers to steer clear of generic creations and instead infuse them with contradictions. Moreover, he guides them to grant even the most grotesque monsters a touch of elegance, a sense of beauty amidst their monstrosity. In this regard, Ueda shares a common ground with Miyazaki. In the development of the game Shadow of the Colossus, he outlined guidance for creating unique and unforgettable creatures for the game. He explained, Regarding the design of the Colossi, we tried to avoid so-called game-like monsters. We want to create a mystical impression. I made a few designs, and then when I had a few more ideas, I chose from the ones I had drawn. I was very careful when I was making the selections, and I made sure that the strategy elements didn't overlap. We didn't go for the ones that looked different but had the same way of defeating as another Colossus. In our recent video about Total Direction, we learned that Miyazaki not only participates in the various aspects of game design, but also actively engages in the work related to the soundtrack and background music. Similarly, Ueda takes an active role in directing the music for the game. Here is a brief conversation between Kenji Kaido and Ueda, discussing the approach they used for Shadow of the Colossus. Kaido explained, When you're moving around on the field, there are only environmental sounds like the wind and sound effects like Wanda and Agro's voices. When you're fighting a colossus, you'll hear a different kind of background music. We used a similar technique in Ico. Weta added, We changed the background music at milestone moments, such as when you meet the colossus, or when you undo its tricks and hold on to its body. We also used different types of music for the same scene depending on the colossus's appearance, so I hope you'll pay attention to that as well. In fact, we wanted to change the tempo and type of music based on where Wanda is on the Colossus, but we couldn't do it because of capacity. It's a shame, because the music was made to match the appearance of each Colossus. New players of the Souls titles often complain about the lack of stories in the games. However, veteran members of the community argue that the lore and story are present. You just need to know where to look and pay attention. Similarly, Ueda focuses on intricate details in the game, not by adding fragments of lore in the world, but through character animation. He prioritizes visual and gameplay storytelling over environmental storytelling, requiring immersive and top-notch animation. 
As an example in Shadow of the Colossus, Weta shared how they achieved the natural behavior of the horse. He said, All the motions were done by hand by the animators, not only for aggro, none of it was captured. Motion capture doesn't make things more realistic. We believe that the movement in your mind is more realistic, although it may not be the most realistic. That's not the only reason why we don't use motion capture, though. To make everything look natural, we had to single out every little animation that looked wrong. It was a very long process to go through. Kenji Kaido expanded on this, saying, To make character movement look and behave naturally, we had to use something called motion blending. For example, by blending the running and turning animations of the horse into each other, we were able to recreate natural movement. And don't forget that since the colossi are huge, any mistake or strangeness in their animation would look totally out of place. We came up with a method to control even the most minute of animations. In an earlier section about the attributes of Ueda's games, we discussed how he achieves immersive gameplay and why it is very important to him. Similarly, Miyazaki's games are highly immersive. For instance, the way his games handle the concept of death differs significantly from other games. The idea and mechanics of death and revival are embedded in the lore of his games. Thus, when a character dies, the player is not removed from the game or reminded that they are playing a game. Instead, the character's death is contextualized within the game's lore, and it does not result in a game over, as in traditional games. Another example related to Ueda is found in the game Shadow of the Colossus, where one of the initial challenges for players is finding a colossus. In a typical game, a map might display a blinking dot indicating the location, or an NPC could provide directional guidance. However, Ueda's attention to detail led him to devise a more immersive solution. He introduced a sword with a unique mechanic that enables players to track down the various colossi. Ueda explained, I aim to design simple games. There are no villagers who give you hints. The only clue is the light that comes from the sword. I wanted a clue that was direct and only expressible visually. When exploring the worlds of Ueda's games, you'll sense the impression of a once thriving, sophisticated civilization that has fallen into ruin. Spending hours traversing these environments allows you to piece together your own theoretical narrative about what this world might have looked like in its prime. Similarly, in Miyazaki's games, which often revolve around post-apocalyptic scenarios, there's an undeniable feeling that the world you're navigating holds a rich history brimming with lore and backstories. Regarding the approach to creating immersive worlds, Ueda shared, Things that have a history just by themselves tell us so much about them from the damage and tarnish due to deterioration. What's appealing about that is that it evokes imagination, I think. It makes you wonder what kind of history it's got. I didn't want the player to think that these were levels created by designers. I wanted them to believe that beyond their screen was a castle that had existed for a very, very long time, which was built by someone they didn't know. Another shared trait between Weda and Miyazaki is their reluctance to include a map feature in their games. This deliberate choice compels players to familiarize themselves intimately with the game world. Miyazaki, however, deviated from this pattern in Elden Ring which can be understood considering the vast scale of the game. In Weda's Shadow of the Colossus, he not only omitted a map feature, but also introduced an innovative yet intuitive method for locating the colossi. In a conventional game, one might expect a map with an arrow or compass indicating the target location. Explaining his design approach, Ueda shared, Like the action controls I mentioned earlier, it's all about how complex you can make things with simple controls, and how much scope you can add. It's the same with the sword. It's not just a tool for attacking. It's also a way of pointing you in the right direction. In a normal game, you can use a directional magnet to show where you are going, or you can use a dot on the map, or you can use a villager to tell you that you are going that way. There are many ways to do this, but the most natural one I came up with is to hold a sword up to the sunlight and it will show you the direction. In our videos about the making of Demon Souls and Dark Souls, we learned about the small size of Miyazaki's team during their development. This fact often surprises Western guests when they visit from software's office. As Miyazaki's more extreme version, Weta pushed this idea further by having the smallest possible team during the making of Eco and Shadow of the Colossus. Weta remarked, During the development of Eco, our team was small at first, maybe five people. 
Eventually we got up to 15, and ultimately had about 20 people working on it. The team next to us, however, was developing The Legend of Dragoon at the same time. I think they had over 100 people on that. Even by Japanese standards, Ueda's team size was remarkably small, emphasizing his distinctive approach to game development. He assumed multiple roles within the team, and even then, found time to actively adjust the team member's output, according to his preferences. He continued this approach with Shadow of the Colossus, maintaining a maximum team size of 35 people at the peak of game development. We learned from our earlier videos about Miyazaki's preference not to create sequels for his games, no matter how successful they are. He was always looking forward to creating new worlds for the players. Likewise, Ueda prefers not to create sequels. One might even say that he has a disdain for making them. He shared, I do not really like the idea of sequels. I want to try many new things. That is what I feel I have to do next. As a final point regarding the similarities between Ueda and Miyazaki, it's noteworthy that their focus largely centers on enhancing gameplay immersion. They both exhibit an obsessive commitment to their vision and execute diligently to amplify their respective goals. For instance, in Sekiro, Miyazaki deliberately removed several features integral to the Souls series formula, such as the corpse run, online features, and summoning. Despite these being beloved by fans, their removal was aimed at creating a specific gaming experience. Similarly, Ueda approaches game design akin to pruning a tree, eliminating anything he deems superfluous to uphold his vision. In an interview discussing Shadow of the Colossus, when questioned about the absence of people in the game's overworld, he explained his deliberate choice. Ueda shared, That's why there are no humans in the land of ancient times. But there's also a game design reason for this. When you put people on the field, you have to make them talk to each other, don't you? If you put people on the field, you have to talk to them. And if you don't talk to them, you can't move on, or you have to get off your horse and go to them, and it interferes with the tempo of the game. In this game I wanted to emphasize the exhilaration of riding through a vast field on a horse. That's why we decided that the land of ancient times is completely uninhabited. As we have shared earlier in the attribute section for Ueda, the core difference between him and Miyazaki is that Ueda is first and foremost an artist, while Miyazaki is an avid gamer. If we understand this, every difference between them becomes clearer and easier to grasp. The main reason why Ueda seemed unconventional and yet so profound in his opinions on game design is that he is more of an outsider compared to Miyazaki. Wearing the hat of an artist, he thinks out of the box and comes up with innovative approaches that a creator entrenched in the game industry would not think of. Let's consider a few concrete examples. Many game journalists and fans praise how Miyazaki's games break the trend of long tutorials and endless cutscenes and bring gameplay to the forefront. If there is a person who is more deserving of this praise more than Miyazaki, it's Ueda, as he takes the approach even further and to the extreme. Here is a sample conversation aligned with this topic, and in which Ueda is very vocal about how he thinks games should evolve, something Miyazaki would never do. In the interview, the host commented, You know, that just reminded me of something, but in Shadow of the Colossus, the player is able to move the camera even during the cutscenes. For instance, in the scene after you defeat the Colossus, and you hear that voice from above, you can subtly influence the movement of the camera. Ueda replied, that comes from an idea I've had since Eco. In the future, video games must get away from having scenes where the player has absolutely no control or is doing nothing. On the one hand, such movie scenes can be necessary to tell the story. But I still think developers should find a way to do that which allows the player to be in control, so they don't feel their time is being wasted meaninglessly. The host commented, Right, anywhere the player can interpose himself directly, he should be allowed to do so to the fullest extent possible. I think that somehow, in that sense, you're the best possible successor to simpler games like Dragon Quest. You take the player's intention very seriously. Ueda replied, I like Dragon Quest, but the biggest thing for me is that I want to see video games standing on par with other mediums of entertainment, not be subsumed by them. That is to say, I want games to do things that only video games can do. Now think carefully, can you imagine Miyazaki or Miyamoto saying things like that? Even though Ueda has only created very few games, the reason why he gets prominence in game design is that he brings ideas that can push the evolution of the medium forward. His creations are not just games, 
but samples of the medium that can push its evolution. It is in this context that he gains his significant place in the history of game design. We've discussed multiple times that when developing a new game, Miyazaki doesn't categorize his target audience by markets, nationalities, ages, or cultures. Instead, he focuses on a single audience, those who love playing games. That's why his games deeply resonate with passionate players and are considered hardcore games. On the other hand, Ueda, primarily an artist, views casual players as his primary target audience. This significant difference in approach between the two game designers stems from their origins and backgrounds. Ueda identifies as an artist, while Miyazaki identifies as a gamer. Ueda's perspective becomes evident in a quote where he stated, With Ico, at that time, the games I wanted to make weren't really like video games. I wanted to make entertainment that used computers. So, when it came to the target audience, I thought about people who don't usually play games. So, I wanted a theme that would appeal to these people. And that's how the concept for Ico was formed. It was intentionally designed with that in mind. While Ueda and Miyazaki share many similarities in their approach to game design, with the former often representing an extreme version of the latter, their ultimate objectives in creating games differ significantly. Ueda meticulously crafts the entire game's flow to offer players an emotional and profoundly immersive experience. Each moment within the game is carefully structured to culminate in a cathartic conclusion that leaves a lasting impression on the player, resonating long after they've completed the game, akin to impactful movies and books. In contrast, Miyazaki's games focus on the immediate struggle of confronting intense difficulties presented by various challenges. The satisfaction comes from triumphing over these challenges in the present moment. While Miyazaki's games might not provide the same level of immersion as Ueda's, they are highly enjoyable. Consider a specific example. Torrent of Elden Ring versus Agro of Shadow of the Colossus. Both are well designed but serve different purposes. Despite being developed 20 years earlier than Elden Ring, the horse in Shadow of the Colossus offers a wider range of animations and movements. In Elden Ring, Torrent is designed for exploration but primarily to enhance combat, aligning with Miyazaki's goal of providing players with the joy of overcoming tough challenges. Conversely, in Shadow of the Colossus, Ueda and his team meticulously crafted the horse's animations and movements to maximize player immersion, aiming to deliver an emotional experience that lingers even after the game concludes. We have finally reached the reboot event. By this point, we should all be familiar with Ueda's background, his attributes, and the similarities and differences between him and Miyazaki. As we delve into the conference's topics, we will gain more context and further insight. The first topic discussed in their reboot presentation is about animation and its role in immersive gameplay. The host pointed out that in Ueda's works, there exists an emotional bond between the characters and the player. He then inquired about how this emotional connection related to the animation. Ueda shared, The ideal is to create a sensation that the characters on the screen are truly alive. Living characters should not have unnatural movements, so there is a continual need to painstakingly refine aspects like motion connections and transitions. It's not easy. We have to spend time adjusting continuously. Seeking naturalness is crucial, not only for the main character, but also for NPCs. This is important for conveying a sense of connection. By refining the animation until it achieves a sense of being alive and designing systems and levels where characters need each other, stronger bonds can be formed. In this reply, you can remember our discussion earlier on how Ueda and his team painstakingly animated the horse in Shadow of the Colossus. And they did it not for the joy of combat like in Miyazaki's games, but to achieve that level of immersion leading to an emotional experience for the player. Ueda added, Whenever animating multiple frames together, I first try to create that feeling, and then in each of those animation frames painstakingly look over and over again, and try to correct those things that occur when you generate a lot of animation. It's very much like a craftsman that's constantly going over the same art over and over again to try and find that perfection. NPCs with natural animations make it easier for players to forge a connection with them, whether it's your horse or a young princess who needs saving. This is another reason why a lot of my games are able to create emotion. Miyazaki agreed with Ueda and shared that he has emphasized character animation since Demon's Souls. He added that during the development of Demon's Souls, they hired animators specifically to work on animations, 
because previously, those tasks were often done by those who created character and object models. Miyazaki added, In my games, the focus is not necessarily on reality, but on good gameplay. I'm willing to sacrifice reality for the game to be played well. As I work on games with a lot of combat, attack and defense animations must be precise. The second topic they discussed relates to the creation of a story for the game and the approach for game development in general. The designers agreed that story creation for video games should not begin early. Weta believes it shouldn't start before a prototype is made. He shared, Once the motion is completed, we refine the game design and level design. At the initial stages of the project, we have a certain plot like the summary and ending decided, but there isn't what you might call a game scenario. When creating games with a visual focus, if you prepare a script that says, this is what we want to do before the visuals exist, then it may not have the chance to reach the quality we expected. As we progress through game production, we begin to be able to do more things, such as effects and various controls. We can then use these completed tools to fully express the cutscenes and stories. For this reason, we often start creating cutscenes later in the game's production. Visuals and gameplay define games. The story comes afterward and can be modified as needed. Miyazaki shared the same view and added that the story itself shouldn't be overly burdensome. He said, The basics are the same. We have a rough synopsis at the beginning, but as the game is being made, additions and changes are made, and by the time the game is completed, very little of the original synopsis remains. There are two reasons for this approach. The first is that the story optimized for a game can only be seen while the game is being created. Secondly, this is my preference, but I want to reflect in the story the problems and stimuli that arise during the process of game development, or the wonderful things that come out of nowhere. That way, it becomes a living story and a living world. If you remember our video on the making of Sekiro, the producer of the game, Robert Conkey, shared exactly this observation when asked about his feedback on the game development process in From Software. Robert Conkey shared, the development styles in Japan and the United States are generally different. In my personal opinion, in the American development scene, specifications are crucial. It's essential to have the entire game's content detailed in the specifications from start to finish. On the other hand, in Japan, it's often the case that ideas are developed and expanded upon during the creation process. There's an atmosphere where even new ideas that emerge during production can be implemented because they're deemed interesting. Now, returning to the reboot event, Miyazaki added, I enjoy creating a story from within chaos while building the game. I like things that are a little distorted and chaotic, things that can't be created just by thinking in your head. That's the kind of world I want to create. Hence, I will be crafting the story while creating the game. The approach to product development that Miyazaki described is not limited to game creation. Another legendary artist who employs a similar approach is Hayao Miyazaki known for creating animated films. During the making of Princess Mononoke and his other films, he forgoes writing a screenplay and dives directly into storyboarding, crafting the story as it unfolds. For both Ueda and Miyazaki, the refinement of story details doesn't occur until they witness the actual animation and gameplay. Even then, they continue to modify it as the game development progresses. Miyazaki also mentioned that this method of changing while creating extends to level design. He stated, The gameplay must be the soul. There's indeed something enjoyable about creating and placing characters within the world. Ueda and Miyazaki agreed that placing enemies in the game can also shape the story. Miyazaki shared, An enemy in one place will mean one thing, while that same enemy in another place will tell a completely different story. If you then give that character an important role in the narrative, the changes will disrupt the storyline so there's no point in tying yourself to the story. You have to be flexible. Ueda revealed that the order of enemies in the game Shadow of the Colossus constantly changed during development. He shared, While working on the game, you have to constantly think about how the game flows. Creating things in a specific order doesn't guarantee higher quality. Sometimes, rearranging the order after seeing the materials might ultimately result in a better outcome. It was the same with the rooms in Eco. Flexibility is important. Miyazaki added that most people working on his games don't find out the whole story until the game is released. They then discussed the topic of exposition in the game and how the story unfolds. 
The host noted a commonality he had observed in both of their works, mentioning that the protagonist's dialogue is kept to a minimum. He then asked if this was an intentional choice. Weta replied, Since it's a game, we want to minimize non-playable time. This is why there's a scarcity of voice and text. However, the recent trend of games having no voice or text at all might be a bit excessive. Games without language are starting to feel somewhat stale. Miyazaki agreed and expressed a similar stance, saying the games they have made are not for reading text. He stressed that the core of their games is primarily about action. Consequently, other forms of information are kept at a minimum. Rather than merely having a low number of dialogues, Miyazaki clarified that the reason is more about leaving things unsaid. He explained, I want to create space for imagination and interpretation. Personally, I enjoy such experiences, and it should make the story and game world more personal to the player. I want players to have a lot of freedom in that sense. Too much story, too much text, and too many characters talking diminish the enjoyment, while video game worlds are meant to be explored and played in. The host then inquired whether Ueda's game design direction leans toward high quality, with fewer assets, aiming to craft a more concise gaming experience. Ueda remarked that the outcome was somewhat inevitable. When he began directing games, the development team consisted of about 15 people, and they didn't have extensive experience in game production. In facing other larger and more experienced teams, he found it impractical to create a large game with wide breadth. Consequently, he embraced a strategy of reducing the number of elements as much as possible, increasing the time spent on each element, and improving the quality of the small world, and considered a story that would work under those conditions. This production approach remains with Ueda even today. On Miyazaki's side, he shared that he does not limit the number of elements in a game. He said, When it comes to deciding whether to create a game narrowly and deeply, or broadly and shallowly, it is deeply rooted in what kind of game you want to create. Some of the things that get me excited about RPGs are things like seeing weapons lined up in rows and looking at monster compendiums. I like seeing and reading things like that. Even in novels, I prefer stories with many characters, such as Game of Thrones. Ueda agreed with Miyazaki's view and pointed out, In the end, it's a matter of preference. I'm the type of person who doesn't want to play games that have thick manuals. Thus, one's preferences for games they want to play influence their choices in game design steering them toward creating games they themselves can enjoy. The host then delved into why the two of them wanted to create games. Weta shared, Originally, I liked the Sega hardware, and later I encountered the Amiga and became fond of games. However, at that point, I didn't have the game industry in mind. Rather, I was aiming for the world of art. Since I couldn't even program, I never thought about entering the game industry. Upon graduating from university and needing a job for livelihood, a decision regarding employment had to be made. Ueda shared that as a compromise, he entered the world of video games. Although he has been making games for almost 25 years now, during the initial 10 to 15 years, he confessed to creating games with skepticism, thinking, is it really okay to make video games? While he now firmly believes that game development is his vocation, looking back, he said, there were doubts before, and I thought I could leave the game industry at any time. That's why I was able to take bold directions, such as Eco and Shadow of the Colossus, which went against the norms of that era's games. I think there was a recklessness due to youth, without considering the consequences. On Miyazaki's side, he said that the reason for entering game development was simple. He shared, I've been a game otaku, and have loved games since childhood, including analog games. Due to certain circumstances, I couldn't play games much during my childhood, which intensified my longing for them. Miyazaki entered the game industry at the age of 30, and at that point, he had reasons beyond just liking games. He explained, There are two reasons. First, the media of games has a unique power. Games are a medium that gives independent value to actions and tasks over time, and this is the strength of games. This strength would only continue to grow. There is hope for the future of the gaming medium. Secondly, games are closely related to technology and technology is advancing at a tremendous rate. This means that there will be no shortage of opportunities and stimulation to create new things for some time to come. It seems like it will be a lot of fun to make it my lifelong work. The host then inquired about their worldview in games, mentioning that in Ueda's works, there isn't a Japanese-style world, 
and until Sekiro in Miyazaki's works. He asked for the reasons behind this. Ueda explained, I have thought about whether I can incorporate something like the nostalgia I feel for Japan as a landscape into the game because I grew up with Japanese values. However, there is anxiety about conveying personal nostalgia globally and whether it will be understood. Additionally, when I create and fashion game worlds, I want to have the freedom to make anything. The second you tie it to reality too much, then there's a bunch of rule sets you have to be wary of and it takes away a lot of the fantasy or creativity as a game designer. So from my perspective, I want to have as much freedom as possible and really make my own game worlds. Regarding this topic, Miyazaki's views align almost entirely. He expressed concerns about whether the Japanese-style worldview depicted in Sekiro would be accepted worldwide and still feels uncertain about it. Furthermore, concerning the world setting, he stated, it's a world for the game, and the more we use the real world as a motif, the less freedom we have. In practice, while Sekiro is set in a Japanese-style world, its setting and characters are not directly based on reality. It could be considered a Japanese-style fantasy. At the end of the session, the host asked the two about their thoughts on indie games. Ueda shared, I've been playing many indie games lately and have been greatly entertained as a player. As a fan, I hope many games with new ideas continue to be created. Miyazaki agreed and replied, I haven't made games from an indie standpoint, so I can't say anything authoritative. As someone in the game industry and as a game enthusiast, I believe diversity is necessary in the gaming industry. In terms of genres, game scale, or for whom games are made, having various perspectives makes it more interesting and results in a vibrant and energetic industry. As a conclusion to our video discussing Ueda and Miyazaki, I'd like to share two quotations from them aimed at budding game creators. This marks our penultimate entry before we transition into a game design channel. To all of you who dream of creating a game someday, I leave you with this quotation from Ueda. He shared, For a long time, I was very worried whether a game created in this way would be accepted by players. There were no stats, no scoring. Would players really accept a game that only had a story and a realistic world? But rather than take a left turn into some compromised vision, I thought it would be best if we push ahead with the original idea as planned. You could say that our very youth and inexperience were significant factors in our not having to compromise. The planners, designers, and even I were almost all inexperienced. If there had been more experienced members on the development team, the game might not have turned out this way and from Miyazaki himself, a statement he shared with the audience of the Reboot Conference. He said, This may sound presumptuous, but let's create interesting games together.